Um, all right, thank you so much for this opportunity today uh, to talk about uh, the nutrient side of things. Uh, we have learned about the production side. Uh, now it's the time to learn about uh, how these litter release nutrients. And I'm gonna talk from two viewpoints, both uh, agronomic as well as the environmental viewpoint. We all know that the demand for meat production is on rise and, and this graph clearly illustrates the past 70 years of data and you can clearly see the line that is in green. That's the one uh, is the broiler production in the United States. And uh, you know it has a very promising growth curve, a linear trend as well. So in, in future as well, we'll see this because the demand for white meat, uh, which is uh, coming from broilers, uh, is, is increasing. But the other problem is, uh, of course, when we are producing more um, uh, wheat meat, we also produce more waste. And I'd like to bring your attention towards uh, Alabama. Uh, Alabama is the state uh, number second agricultural industry, and it has a $15 billion impact on Alabama's economy. And also uh, it is uh, second largest uh, in the United States uh, when it comes to broiler production. The problem is uh, the industry generates around 1.5 million tons of litter that has almost 19,000 uh, tons of phosphorus in it. Um, so as we all know that litter is applied mostly on land for row crops and pasture lands. So I ran a quick, um, search uh, with our National Agricultural Statistics Service to survey to find out like how many acreage of operations uh, or farm operations are there in Alabama and that comes around 8.9 million acres. Uh, out of 8.9 million, we have around 2.1 million acres of land under uh, row crops and hay crops. So if we have to apply litter at one ton an acre, uh, we, can, we can fertilize uh, our al almost 1.5 million acres of land. That is way below um, uh, than how much we produce. Uh, but of course, if uh, the rates start going up, uh, yeah, less than, uh, we, I mean, the, the, the number of acres uh, drop down uh, drastically. This means like we will not have enough litter uh, for all the row crops and uh, hay crops uh, that are produced in Alabama. Uh, but there could be multiple usages of litter as well, uh, just not only in row crops or pasture, litter can be applied or used in horticultural crops as well as uh, forest lands, uh, primarily in pine, uh, pine lands. Um, so today I'm going to talk and show you some of the data and the research that my lab group has been doing over the past uh, two years. Um, this picture, of course, you see here in the center is the corn plot that received poultry litter. And you can see very distinctly that the corn plots look much greener, much taller than their neighboring plants. Uh, I'd like to show you a video quickly here uh, because, you know, an extension we say, it, there's a saying that seeing is believing. And uh, I'll definitely like to show you this video that we took from our corn plots. And you can see here, uh, this, this, these are the plots where you see these tall corn. Um, those are the plots that received poultry litter and very distinctly, uh, they are much taller, much greener um, than their neighboring plants, uh, which did not receive litter, uh, but just a straight PK and nitrogen from a synthetic fertilizer. Um, this is a long video, so I'll just try to move to the next slide here um, and provide you some more information about uh, this experiment. So we conducted this experiment in three sites in Alabama on three different soil types, um, you know, uh, which are loamy sand, uh, sandy loam and clay loam and three different production environments as well. So here we typically uh, plant corn on the first week of April and harvest uh, somewhere between late August and first week of September. Um, it's, it's very difficult uh, to show you the results of all the, all the uh, locations, but uh, I'll just show a few. 
But uh, among all the, there, there are several other treatments, but besides that, we have three important treatments that I would like to focus for this presentation. So our goal was to apply 150 pounds of nitrogen on an acre basis, and we selected, we had three different treatments. The first treatment was where we applied that 150 pounds of nitrogen through urea. Our second treatment was where we applied using litter, uh, two and a half tons of litter per acre. And then the third treatment was where we use a combination where we applied litter uh, 1.25 tons to an acre as a pre-plant. And then we applied 75 pounds of nitrogen via urea at V6. So the total nitrogen was 150 pounds on an acre basis. Uh, this is uh, the result coming from the central Alabama. And what we are seeing here is that Indeed, litter literally doubled the, the, uh, the ill uh, bushels, especially in 2018, as well as in 2019. You can see that the, uh, the plots that received just the urea had on an average 48 bushels corn compared to the plots that received uh, litter had uh, 99 bushels, whereas the plots that received litter and urea uh, the average uh, uh, yield was around 101 bushel. And again, this is a dryland corn, so don't get confused with irrigated one. Uh, year 2019 was a pretty dry year, a lot of heat, heat stress, very less precipitation, and we see that the yield decreased proportionately among all the treatments, but still uh, those plots that received litter had a much higher um, on an average basis, uh, corn bushels uh, compared to uh, the plots that received urea. Uh, we also uh, studied the same situation for soybean. Uh, here we had three different treatments. The first treatment was uh, the application rate of one ton. Uh, the second was two and a half ton. And the third treatment was five tons. And you can clearly see distinctly what it means when you apply one ton of poultry litter probably you, you barely see it versus the 2.5 tons where you start seeing like, yeah, there's something is put on the ground, but when you apply five tons, you can distinctly see that, uh, yeah, I mean, there is, there's a lot of uh, stuff in the ground. So, uh, but the whole point here is to show you the difference between the control plots and the plots that receive the litter. And, and you can clearly see here, so the, on the right corner bottom, uh, that's the control plot that received no litter, uh, whereas the other three pictures are from the plots that received litter. And, and there's a distinct uh, growth, dis distinction in the growth and the vigor of the soybeans. Um, so when it comes to yield, uh, what we see in both the years is uh, in year 2018, which was a normal year, we see a 10 bushel difference between those plots, between control plots and the plots that receive litter. Uh, whereas in 2019, uh, there was hardly like four to five bushels difference between control plots and the plots that received um, uh, poultry litter. Um, now let's uh, look in a little bit more uh, closely into the into the composition of poultry litter. Well, uh, poultry litter is uh, of course is a mixture of feces, spilled feed, water, feathers, and bedding materials. And and some of the common bedding materials that are used here in Alabama are like peanut hull or pine savings or wood chips. And if we look more deeper into the litter of the chicken feces itself, the feces is actually 70% uric acid, and the remaining 30% is urea, ammonia, creatine, or the undigested protein. But the thing is when uh, the uric acid is highly unstable and gets converted quickly into urea, and then urea gets converted into ammonia, and ammonia could have two fats, as we all know, and we just learned it can be volatilized quickly as ammonia gas, or it can be nitrified and then eventually converted into uh, nitrate, which are the plant available forms of uh, nitrogen. So we try to understand uh, that uh, when and how much nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium is released during the growing se session. But we are also interested in understanding that does the nutrient release pattern from litter application change when we change the application rates? 
Uh, again, this experiment was conducted at three different locations on three different soil types in Alabama. Uh, we had uh, the treatments were a one ton litter, uh, 2.5 tons litter, and five tons litter on an acre basis. And we used a decomposition bag technique where we uh, weighed an equivalent amount of litter um, and we buried them in the top two inches of the soil in the field. Um, and we collected these bags at a 10 days interval and eventually uh, later in the season at 30 days interval and then analyzed for uh, nutrients, mostly nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, what we were, we, what we are seeing, and again, like these rates change from one location to the other, but I'd like to show you for one location, the data from just one location. What we are finding here is uh, that indeed there is a difference in nutrient release rates between different application rates. So R1 is one ton an acre, R2 is 2.5 tons to an acre, and then R3 is a five ton an acre. Uh, when we look into the nitrogen part, within the first 30 days after application, you can see that the litter which was applied at one ton an acre, that released the most nitrogen compared to 2.5 versus 5 tons. So as you increase the, the rate of the litter, the amount of nitrogen that is released is slows down. Uh, with potassium, what we are seeing, we are seeing a similar trend, just like nitrogen. I mean, the less you apply, the more is it, more it is released uh, within the first 30 days after application. But with phosphorus, uh, it's, a, it's a different story here. Uh, what we found was uh, when the application rate goes up, uh, the amount of phosphorus that is released goes up as well. And, and, we, and I'll talk uh, in, in my coming slides uh, why it happens. But just to give you a flavor here of the way litter releases nutrients, it's very dependent upon the soil type and also the rates of application. And, and, uh, and there's a wide range uh, between uh, the way the litter release nutrients. Um, you know, from this experiment, what we are learning is, you know, the, the way litter releases nutrients are in phases. You know, the first phase is the initial rapid phase uh, that happens within the first 30 days. Then you see a phase of constant release between 40 to 45 days, and then a decline phase between 70 and uh, onwards. Uh, so that's how uh, the litter is releasing nutrients when it comes to nitrogen or potassium or phosphorus. Now let's flip the coin and talk about the environmental part. So we all know that when a land receives a litter on a repeated basis, on an annual basis, uh, every single year after year, uh, the soil test phosphorus goes up and up. Um, and, and there are several consequences when the soil phosphorus is high, uh, you know, it can get lost either through erosion or runoff losses, or if you are in a deep sand in a car system, uh, the phosphorus can leach down into the groundwater. Um, so we thought like, okay, uh, we now know the different uh, pathways. Why don't we try to understand uh, if there are differences uh, in phosphorus re release between different litter types. So what we did was we had, we studied three different kinds of litter. The first litter is the fresh litter, which is collected within the first six months, maybe after four or five flocks. Uh, the second litter that we studied was a caked litter uh, where the growers decaked it after a year or two years or three years. And the third kind of litter that we studied in this uh, in this experiment was a composted or aged litter. So these, this, this litter is the litter that sits in the barn for several years or it goes through a natural composting process. Uh, so we, we studied the phosphorus release from these three different litter types. So broadly from an environmental standpoint, uh, poultry litter contains three different kinds of phosphorus or three different species of phosphorus to be more specific. 
Uh, the first one, uh, which is uh, which is the cause of all the water quality issue, is the dissolved reactive phosphorus. And this is the phosphorus. In fact, it, it is the one that is available to the plants as well. The second species is uh, of phosphorus is the dissolved non-reactive phosphorus. Uh, and, and, and the third uh, species is the recalcitrant or very difficult uh, or hard. I mean, this, this is the form of phosphorus that are very resistant and, and they do not uh, release phosphorus pretty easily. And, and the idea was, uh, the idea or the motive behind this study was to understand like if a producer uh, spreads poultry litter in his field, um, and there's a series of rainfall events which leads into generation of runoff uh, in the field. Uh, how much phosphorus can, can be expected to release during each rainfall events, assuming that there were some consecutive rainfall uh, in, 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 in after the application of uh, poultry litter? Uh, so we ran this experiment in a lab. Uh, lab this is a lab-based uh, experiment. And what we did was we chose uh, a litter rate and uh, we washed we, we studied through a wash cycle with uh, the rain, like a DI, DI water. And what we are observing is that right in the first flush, which you can think about the first rainfall after application, that's the time when you see the most amount of phosphorus or the dissolved phosphorus is released from the litter. But eventually, after the third wash cycle or the third rainfall event, you know, most of this dissolved phosphorus has been released and uh, the release rate of this dissolved phosphorus slows down after the fourth, fifth, sixth, and eventually at seventh, you do not see a lot of phosphorus being released from the poultry litter. So in terms of percentages, what we see that there is a distinct difference between uh, these different kinds of litter and the litter which was collected uh, or the cake litter that was collected for after like a year or two years, uh, that uh, has the most uh, dissolved reactive P uh, and that equates around 21% of the total extractable phosphorus. On the other hand, uh, the composted litter, uh, you know, it released uh, quite a less compared to one to three years old litter and, um, and, and six months old litter as well. Uh, but you can see here from this data that uh, with every successful rainfall event, uh, the total amount or the percent of, percentage of the reactive phosphorus, which is a sum of DRP and DNRP, uh, that kind of decreases down uh, after the fourth uh, rainfall event. So in total, if we look uh, from an uh, environmental standpoint, uh, what was really striking to us was uh, only 31 to 46 percent of phosphorus that is present in litter, it is readily solub soluble by water, meaning when you apply litter and there's a rainfall event and, the, and there's a sequence of rainfall event, you can expect uh, 31 to 46 percent of uh, phosphorus to get dissolved in these rainfall events, whereas the remaining 54 to 69 percent of phosphorus is not water soluble phosphorus, meaning they cannot, those phosphorus cannot be washed or even released by just simply rainwater. Uh, there, is, there would be a second agent that needs to act, maybe a microbial. Uh, Decom it has to go through a microbial decomposition or, or some sort of uh, uh, drying and wetting cycle in order to release that uh, non-water non extractable phosphorus. Uh, and, and again, uh, we see quite a bit of difference between the litter types. So the take home point here is simply that uh, there is a difference in the, in the total phosphorus, the total reactive phosphorus that is released and it differs between litter types as well. I mean, are you, uh, is, is a person applying a really fresh litter versus a composted litter or a one to three year old litter? So uh, to sum up my presentation, I would like to say that yes, there is a yield benefit of litter application from row crops. 
uh, the nutrient release, uh, of course, differs between application rates and soil types, and it is very difficult to put a number there. We can talk about range, but we cannot talk about like just one number. Um, the amount of bio level or the dissolved reactive phosphorus, it uh, differs between litter types. So not all the litter release phosphorus uh, in the same amount. So that, that, that should be noted. And the most important implication is, you know, uh, most dissolved reactive phosphorus is released within the first three rainfall events. And, and this has a lot of implication, especially uh, for those producers who apply litter in the winter months and, and, when, and then they just leave it there and there's a series of rainfall events in the winter. So, and then if there is generation of rainfall, uh, Basically, those rainfall event can wash this uh, soluble phosphorus into the runoff water. Uh, so timing of litter is very important to prevent uh, that reactive phosphorus to enter into the water stream. Uh, I would like to acknowledge my lab group uh, who have worked on these projects and also the funding agencies and the partners who provided money uh, to conduct this uh, research and uh, some of these are Auburn IGB program, Alabama Experiment Station PAR program. Uh, we are also very thankful to Alabama wheat and feed producers and Alabama soybean producers to, who supported us with these funds to do this uh, work.